this next book is a little bit difficult to sum up in a few words, so I'll just show you the title and you can tell uh, for yourself whether you'll be interested in the topic or, or not. It, uh, it's some, some heavy stuff, but uh, fascinating nonetheless, I thought. Uh, the name of the book is, and let me just turn that one down just a little bit, um, The Theological Origins of Modernity by Michael Allen Gillespie. Just a little bit of beachside reading. Um, this is a, a pretty interesting, I mean, it's obviously, you can probably tell, philosophy, theology, uh, sort of where the Middle Ages or the Renaissance meets what we call the, the modern world. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Um, Michael Allen Gillespie, just for you know, point of reference, is the Jerry G. and Patricia Crawford Hubbard Professor of Political Science in the Trinity College of Arts and Sciences and a, and a professor of philosophy at Duke. So that kind of gives you some idea of where he's coming from. Um, modernity, broadly understood, is a, uh, a realm of individualism, of representation, of subjectivity, of exploration and discovery, of freedom, rights, toleration, liberalism, and the nation-state, is often assumed to be rooted in a growing hostility toward, or at least indifference to, uh, theological ideas. Michael Allen Gillespie uh, uses this book to argue against that point. Uh, rather than a disengagement from theological discourse, he suggests modernity has actually been a completely different set of answers uh, that we would that we don't really recognize as explicitly theological, but actually are. Uh, he begins his discussion by going all the way back to medieval scholasticism, and I'm going to get a little bit into uh, medieval philosophy here for a bit. Um, and particularly, he goes back to the uh, the difference between scholastic realism or universalism and nominalism. Uh, scholasticism was uh, dominated by realist thought, which said that uh, everything in the world was merely a kind of platonic simulacra of the only thing that was real, uh, that is, the perfectly rational divine mind of God. Sometime during the 14th century, uh, William of Ockham uh, became one of the most outspoken opponents against realism and for a position known as nominalism. Nominalism rejected the central position of realism and uh, suggested in its turn that such a divine reason which human beings could access and understand didn't even exist in the first place. Uh, Occam was not, for clarity's sake, uh, proposing atheism, um, which I think is, is something that people assume when, when they just hear that he rejected the older scholastic form of realism. Um, he wasn't an atheist. Uh, he insisted on saying that the mind of God was something so dis so distant from the frailties of the of the human intellect that we'll never be able to understand it. Um, sort of like the uh, Deus absconditus of Martin Luther. Uh, this got him in. This got William of Ockham into a lot of trouble uh, with Pope John the Twenty Second, who eventually excommunicated him from the church. The most important takeaway from Gillespie's discussion of Occam is that scholasticism's marriage of the human and divine intellect is ruptured in a really radical way by Occam's nominalism, which replaced it with a chaos of radically different beings and focused on a god of extreme will and uh, omnipotence instead of one whose rational mind was reflected in the perfection of nature. Uh, the rest of the book is taken up with how this idea um, has been co-opted by subsequent thinkers. Uh, the first person Gillespie understands as being in conversation with Occamite nominalism is Petrarch, who is actually one of Occam's contemporaries. 
Uh, Petrarch's idea of the moral life is one starkly in contrast with Aristotle's conception of the zuon politikon, uh, the political life, uh, pursued mostly in private conflicts, uh, in, in conflicts uh, drastically with Roman authors, especially Cicero, whose lives and works uh, he very much cherished and, and revived even. His several books, Plutarch's books, that, that is, um, include a, a Rerum Memorandum, or Memorable Things, and Africa, which is uh, an epic poem that presents the parallel lives of Scipio, Caesar, and Hannibal. And uh, he takes these, these works to sort of detail his, his ideas of the moral life. Um, Gillespie moves on to give a pretty conventional account of Renaissance humanism and some of its major figures, including uh, Machiavelli, uh, Salutati, uh, Ficino, uh, Pico della Mirandola, and Erasmus. He argues very much in line with mainstream historical and historiographical understanding that these humanists place an emphasis, or as Gillespie calls it, an ontic priority on human reason and cognitive faculties rather than a divine being even though almost none of the memorable humanists conclu concluded anything like atheism uh, the rest of the book discusses two pairs of thinkers and each pair and uses each pair to compare and contrast the influences of nominalism and humanism that each offered uh, the first pair is luther and erasmus Gillespie never assumes too much of the reader and therefore spends quite a bit of time giving introductory information about these two people. Um, he suggests that both, but especially Luther, um, were influenced by nominalism and therefore God's radical separation from man. And uh, obviously, if, if you're familiar with uh, Luther's theology, that's not a big surprise. Uh, he sums up the differences and similarities between the two this way. Quote, modernity proper was born out of and in reaction to this conflict, the debate between Luther and Erasmus, as an effort to find a new approach to the world that was not entangled in the contradictions of humanism and the Reformation. To this end, thinkers such as Bacon, Descartes, and Hobbes sought a new beginning that gave priority not to man or to God, but to nature, that sought to understand the world not as a product of a Promethean human freedom, or, a, or of a radically omnipotent divine will, but of the mechanical motion of nature. Modernity in this sense was the result of an ontic revolution within metaphysics that accepted the ontological ground that nominalism established, but that saw the other realms of being through this, through this new naturalistic lens. Uh, Gillespie then goes on to discuss the second pair, uh, which are uh, Descartes and Hobbes and their relative understanding of physics, human psychology, and epistemology. Uh, this, uh, he gives a, a really heavily historical account of their thought refracted through their personal and especially their biographical um, experiences. Gillespie's last chapter discusses some more ideas of modernity, including those of Kant, uh, Kant excuse me, um, especially the uh, sapere aude, the dare to know. Uh, but he also goes into Hegel and a little bit of the German romantics. And one of the more interesting things he talks about here is how Heidegger formulated uh, a prob this problem, na namely not one of de-theologizing or secularization, but is God becoming increasingly concealed or withdrawn from public discourse. So Heidegger was sort of on to the idea that Gillespie's talking about here, that modernity is not so much a rejection of theological importance or discourse, but a, a reformulation of it, um, which I think is sort of um, connotated by the words concealed and withdrawn. Uh, I've, always find, I've, I've always found Heidegger a bit of an enigmatic uh, thinker uh, but really rigorous too, um, and always thought this was an interesting question um, 
a, a way to rethink a, a really complex um, set of ideas. There are a couple critical things that I have to say about the book. Um, I find it perhaps not flatly wrong, but at least odd to suggest that much of the above thought is explicitly answering theological questions. Um, to say that the Enlightenment was all about theology because, it uh, because many of its thinkers disavowed theism uh, seems to be uh, a, a self-consciously defining a moment negatively uh, instead of taking its real central concerns to heart. Uh, could not one just as easily write a book called The Platonic Origins of Modernity, arguing how all of modernity was a response to the platonic forms? I'm sure if you wanted to, you could, but I'm not sure where it would get you. I'm not saying that uh, Gillespie's exercise was uh, nearly that frivolous, but um, it's a question to think about. Uh, this shouldn't detract someone from reading the book, though, especially if you're interested in a really thoughtful, carefully considered, synthetic treatment of all of the thinkers that I mentioned, backed up by a solid historical and philosophical understanding. Um, I may not have agreed with all of Gillespie's conclusions, but this book offers up a lot of questions uh, with anyone for a soft spot for um, intellectual or philosophical history like I have. A lot of interesting things to think about. The origins of the theological origins of modernity by Michael Allen Gillespie.